Hello and welcome. I'm Danny Lichtenfeld, director of the Brattleboro Museum. I'm delighted to be here with you this evening and so pleased that you've chosen to tune in for tonight's talk by curator Karen Wilkin. This event is being held in connection with the exhibition currently on view here called Figuration Never Died, New York Painterly Painting, 1950 to 1970, which features the work of 10 painters whose lives and careers overlapped and intertwined and whose importance in the history of 20th century American painting we felt warranted further consideration. When we decided that this was a topic we wanted to address in the form of an exhibition and a publication, we knew right away that Karen Wilkin was the right person for the job. Karen's prolific writing and curating are always lucid and incisive, and this era in New York art history is one she knows so well. We were thrilled when she agreed to take the project on and we couldn't be more pleased with how it's come to fruition. And by that, I mean not only the exhibition, but also this beautiful accompanying book, which was just published by the Artist Book Foundation. If this topic and these artists interest you, and I assume they do, or else you wouldn't be here this evening, I encourage you to purchase a copy of the book, which you can do through our online gift shop at brattleboromuseum.org. I also heartily encourage you to come see the exhibition in person if you can, if you haven't done so already. But if that's not possible, or you just don't feel comfortable doing that at this time, you may be interested in checking out the 3D interactive virtual tour, which you can find on our website. In just a moment, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Karen, who will join us from her home office in Manhattan and talk with us about the exhibition and these artists in this period of time in New York art history. And after Karen's talk, we'll have a Q&A. And so I hope you'll stick around for that. If you're here via Zoom and there are questions that occur to you during Karen's talk, uh, please type them in using the Q&A button on your screen. That'll be a bit easier for us to monitor than the chat box. And if you're watching via Facebook Live, just use the comment box and we'll keep an eye on that too. For those of you who may not be familiar with Karen Wilkins' work, she is a New York-based curator and art critic and the Atelier Head of Art History at the New York Studio School of Drawing, Painting and Sculpture, where she teaches in the MFA program. She was a Fulbright Fellow and a Woodrow Wilson Fellow She's a regular contributor to the New Criterion and the Wall Street Journal, as well as a contributing editor for art for the Hudson Review. Her publications include monographs on Paul Cezanne, George Brock, Giorgio Morandi, Stuart Davis, Anthony Caro, and David Smith, among others. And she's organized numerous exhibitions nationally and internationally on modern and contemporary painters and sculptors, including one now here in Brattleboro, Vermont. It's my great pleasure at this time to welcome Karen Wilkin. Thank you, Danny. It's a great pleasure to be here. I wish I could see the show. <laughs> I'm hoping to get to Brattleboro to see the show. Uh, before too long. Uh, it's the only exhibition I've ever organized that I've never seen. So this is a first. The show started as a way of honoring Wolf Kahn. And that became a much larger project uh, because we very quickly realized that what would be really interesting would be to contextualize Wolf um, because he belongs to a very special group of artists. I'm going to screen share now. Where is it? The title essentially tells you everything you need to know. 
show is about artists who at a time when most ambitious artists were arguing about the necessity of abstraction and the belief that only abstract art was possible, very stubbornly decided that that wasn't the case. Now, many of them started out as abstract artists. They were uh, students, many of them were students of Hans Hoffmann's, and uh, they, if you like, reverted to figuration. Although Hoffman apparently was always interested in the human figure, the Hoffman students always drew from the human figure. But if you were an ambitious young artist, a serious artist in New York in 1950, uh, obviously, Pollock was one of your heroes, and de Kooning was a hero. De Kooning was, in fact, even more of a hero because people were uh, imitating the way he put on paint um, as well as the kind of abstraction he was making. This kind of layered contingent abstract painting became so much of a manner among young artists uh, and this is the time of the uh, burgeoning alternative gallery scene on 10th Street. Clement Greenberg referred to this as the 10th Street touch. And certainly, if you were going to the Museum of Modern Art um, in the 1950s, uh, you were seeing mostly abstract painting. There was a uh, big show in 1951, which was a kind of uh, overview of American painting. And uh, that was mostly abstract. Most of the one person shows were abstract. I mean, there were, there were referential painters who were included in the, you know, whatever, 16 Americans, 14 Americans, but the emphasis was definitely on abstraction. Then in 1962, uh, a big show was organized of the figure. Uh, it was a show based on submissions. So it wasn't uh, that the curators were out there looking, uh, but it did include a lot of people whom we recognize, like Robert De Niro Sr., uh, like Paul Warner from the West Coast, Elmer Bischoff from the West Coast, Nathan Oliveira from the West Coast. Fairfield Porter reviewed the show and he pointed out that while the show purports to reflect a new interest on the part of artists in figuration, he, the painters had never stopped painting the figure, says it reflects a new interest on the part of critics and curators in figuration. He wasn't buying the fact that painters were not interested. And in fact, even de Kooning, as you know, um, in, 50, in the early 50s started showing this notorious series, The Women, um, in which a lot of people thought he had, you know, lost his mind, abdicated, um, had reverted. And yet there were young artists who found, must have found this very comforting. And those are the artists who are the focus of this show. We, they, you can meet them in their self-portraits. Uh, Paul Rezica, Wolf Kahn, um, painting in very different manners, even though they are holding on to the idea of the figure as primary. Paul George's, very ambitious, very large painting. When uh, Fairfield Porter reviewed the uh, fig big uh, survey of the figure in 62 at the Museum of Modern Art, he regretted that Alex Katz and Paul Georges were not included in the show. Now, they probably didn't submit uh, because as I say, the, the show was uh, based on submissions, chosen from submissions. And I think a lot of artists probably didn't bother to submit. And to Batchnik. Now we're talking about artists who were Hoffman students. And you can certainly see in, in Anne Tabachnik's work that not only had she absorbed 
uh, Hoffman's ideas about how to construct with planes of color, but she had also uh, paid a lot of attention to Matisse. This is her version of Red Studio, if you like. Um, and of course, Hoffman was one of the few people who revered Matisse above Picasso um, at a time when uh, Picasso's name was synonymous with modern art. So she learned that probably from Hoffman as well. These artists are not painting the kind of subject matter um, or not starting from the kind of subject matter that uh, their uh, non-figurative colleagues are starting out with. Uh, they are not channeling universal angst. They are painting their friends. They are painting their children. Um, I don't know who the young man with the red face is in the De Niro. Uh, Nathan is Paul Rezica's oldest son. So uh, they're coming to terms with their own world. And as I'm sure is very clear to you, they're all painting in very, very different ways. Uh, nobody is taking uh, the kind of uh, Im imitation of a single master approach that the de Kooning wannabes were uh, using in the 10th Street Touch. Obviously, De Niro, another Hoffman student, very, very close to Hoffman, um, he is very interested in Matisse. Resica, a Hoffman student, is clearly thinking about old masters. Uh, I mean, Goya is somewhere behind this painting of Nathan. Wolf Kahn painting uh, Emily Mason, uh, his future wife. Um, Paul George's painting his wife um, in ways that are harking back to a tradition of referential painting but in very, very individual ways. Again, two Hoffman students, former Hoffman students, from whom they've learned how to structure space, but they are not painting anything like Hoffman. Alex Katz, who was not a Hoffman student, there are other kinds of connections here. And as we know, um, Hoff, uh, Katz paints over and over and over again, um, Ada del Moro, his wife, his muse, and uh, says that if he could get her right, then could get one person right, then that would become universal. And so he returns to this image over and over again. Early Katz, is very loose, very brushy, very painterly. As, and that's something you could use as an adjective for all of these artists. Uh, they are not using traditional um, representational high finish. They have the same attitude towards their materials that the uh, abstract expressionists whom they are resisting had in that they love paint. They love moving it around on a surface. It's juicy, uh, and say painterly painting, a term that uh, comes from the uh, Swiss German art historian uh, Heinrich Wolflin, who distinguishes between painterly painting, which is loose and brushy, and linear painting, which is very uh, meticulously outlined and filled in. Paul George is painting his family as though it was some kind of uh, classical uh, idyll. That here they are in Arcadia. And uh, if you want a definition of painterly painting, you don't have to look any further than this. A very large painting uh, with his family um, in this idyllic setting. They paint their friends. This is Alex Katz's wedding portrait of uh, his friends, Irving Sandler and Lucy Freeman, a painting which still hangs in the Sandler living room, but is promised um, to a museum. 
uh, very direct, very fresh, and very intimate. Their uh, figures are a little smaller than life size. Grace Hardigan comes at this in a different way. She's very much part of the Abex circle. Um, she lives downtown. She hangs out at the Cedar Bar. But then so does Alice Katz. Alice Katz talks about the great education he got at the Cedar Bar. Wolf Kahn talks about hanging out at the Cedar Bar and how, what a great spirit of camaraderie there was. Hardigan starts out painting abstractly and then gets interested in the old masters. And she starts painting the shop windows on uh, what is now the Lower East Side. So uh, she is very much using recognizable objects. She's using the same generous loose paint um, of her ab ex uh, colleagues, uh, but she is working figuratively. Uh, there are paintings a little just a little before this, which are very, very indebted to old master paintings. She's doing essentially transcriptions. And many of her colleagues thought that was really regressive. Uh, the person who was very supportive was de Kooning. So you can see these boundaries are, are very permeable and there is no real division, but in, in terms of the social life of these artists, but there's certainly an aesthetic division. Hardigan goes to Long Island. Uh, she paints in the summer. Paul Georges is in Long Island. Fairfield Porter, who, as you know, um, is living in Long Island, uh, paints with Paul Georges, with Paul Resica, goes out. Hardigan is out there. Um, you'll see Jane Freilicker is. So there's another layer of connection uh, besides the Hoffman School. The, again, loose, free, uninhibited. If you could see the actual painting, you'd see this lush, a juicy paint application and uh, utterly recognizable without being literal. Resica's path is a little different. Resica spends a lot of time in Italy and he becomes obsessed with old master painting, particularly Venetian painting. So that you have, these are small paintings um, setting up a kind of uh, modern version of a traditional subject matter, um, an angel and a painter in a landscape on Long Island. Well, that's hardly uh, Giorgione's The Tempest, but you know what he's thinking about. And here he is painting Fairfield Porter, painting in Bridgehampton. Uh, it's entirely possible that, you know, Paul Georges is just out of sight off the edge of the canvas. Um, because these painters are all paying attention to each other. Resica goes back and forth to Europe a lot. He spends time in Mexico. He becomes very, very attached to place. So, um, Katz and Lois Dodd, who we'll be looking at in a moment, have another relationship. Um, Lois Dodd was one of the founders of the Cooperative Tanager Gallery on 10th Street. Uh, Alec Katz showed there. And uh, they were both at Skowhegan and were involved in an, an outdoor plein air painting uh, experience, which was life changing for both of them. Both of them were abstract painters. And yet, at the, at the, at, after this discipline of working from the motif out of doors, they both become painters uh, from perception. And they become painters from perception in Maine. They move, uh, spend time in Maine uh, with their respective spouses. They uh, buy houses together. And you get these wonderful early cats, which are the antithesis of what he ends up doing, where he deliberately gets his hand out of the painting and makes it as anonymous as possible. In these early works, he's letting his touch show. He's letting his hand show. And look at this wonderful juicy paint. It even comes through in, in reproduction. 
Lois Jaw, these are large paintings. Um, Lois gets very interested in uh, her surroundings. Um, she's painting the landscape. Th these are all Maine paintings. She, she continues to spend a uh, half her year in Maine, as does Alec Katz. So this becomes a major, major part of their activity. Um, she continues this. I mean, these are the these are from her first years in Maine. She continues to paint from the motif. Uh, you can see the kind of abstract painter she was, but she is becoming more and more attached to specific reference. And as I say, they're both showing at Tanager Gallery. Jane Freilicher is very much part of this group, but she, she is connected with the uh, Long Island part of the group. She's also connected with the New York part. Uh, she's uh, very much uh, part of the New York scene. Uh, she's very close to Porter um, and who is uh, showing and uh, reviewing work at the newly found 1950 uh, founded Gallery. What's interesting about Freilicher is she kind of toggles back and forth between more specific reference, like the painting on the left, and paintings that verge on abstraction again. She goes back and forth in a very um, interesting way. I think we would see the painting on the right as a pure abstraction and not read it as a kind of very suggestive landscape. Um, if we didn't know about the painting on the left uh, coming a couple of years earlier. As I say, she goes back and forth. So you have a painting that's as uh, loose and as non-referential or non-obviously referential as the sky. The title gives us a clue. Then we start seeing again as a very generalized landscape. A um, few years later, she's being as specific as the painting on the right a smaller painting, which is in the Parish Museum. So she, she's going back and forth, in a, in, but she, is, she ends up committing to reference. You know, her, her mature work, uh, the later work, is all referential. Hardigan also kind of toggles back and forth. Um, she gets as specific as the painting on the left, or uh, you can, of course, read the painting on the right in many ways. It, it feels landscapey. It can feel like a still life. Um, you, you start uh, looking for things that you can recognize in it. What's constant, of course, is her sense of very intense saturated color. Painting on the right is much bigger than it appears here. I couldn't get it to go any larger. Wolf Kahn, again, Hoffman's student, he was Hoffman's monitor, in fact. Um, these, would you think this is, the work, this is the work of a Hoffman student? Well, probably not, except the fact that there is a sense of space in them owes a great deal to Hoffman. The epiphany for uh, Wolf Kahn comes when he spends an extended period of time in Italy. And uh, he spends particularly uh, time in Venice. And he says that's when he suddenly starts realizing that there are specific qualities of light in specific places. And that becomes his quest for the rest of his long and very productive career. Uh, the Hoffman structural principles seem much clearer in the late work, which you all know just as it seems much clearer in Paul Rezica's late work, which you all know. But here are these uh, very, very important uh, formative paintings where he is looking hard at specific landscapes and translating the qualities of light that he is uh, so struck by 
into these uh, very specific paintings that are both about particular places and verging on abstractness. And I'm saying abstractness very deliberately rather than abstraction. Rezica at this point is painting very loosely. Um, you know the paintings become much more stylized and uh, much more geometric, but he too is completely given over to specifics of place. And uh, at this point, he is spending uh, a lot of time in uh, uh, outside of Cape Col uh, outside of Provincetown. Um, his wife's family has a compound there and painting very specific places. Um, again, very much responsive to specific light. So there are all kinds of commonalities of pursuit. Um, the, the, uh, as Danny said in his introduction, these are artists whose uh, practices overlap and intertwine. And uh, it's not just that they share a background with Hoffman or an experience in Maine or Long Island or exhibiting at the same places. There are all kinds of uh, commonalities of their idea of what a picture can be or what a picture can be about, even though they're going about it in very different ways. I should have said from the outset that these are all artists of the same generation. They're all born between 1922 and 1928. So they're the next generation after the abstract expressionists. They are contemporary with the uh, other artists who are proposing alternatives to abstract expressionism, the color field painters who are going even further away from imagery. Uh, they are making disembodied paintings that are about color, about the, uh, the process of making a painting, making uh, color and the way paint moves um, the carriers of emotion and uh, wordless meaning. You have the pop artists who are looking towards uh, vernacular culture, advertising, um, also a kind of anonymous surface. They're trying to get their hands out of the painting the way the color field painters are, but in a different way. And this is all coexisting. Uh, coexisting. The difference between this group of artists uh, and the pop artists is obvious. They are all harking back one way or another to the great tradition of perceptual uh, referential painting. And uh, they are essentially turning their back on vernacular culture. Uh, the closest you'll get to it would be uh, the Grace Hardigan paintings of the shop windows. But the way she's treating them owes more to old master painting than anything uh, to do with advertising art. Albert Kresh um, is another uh, Hoffman student, um, overlapped with Resica at the school. And uh, I think this is one of the clearer examples of Hoffman's influence. Uh, turned into uh, referential painting. Uh, this firm structuring with color, this very powerful sense that every plane is taking its place in relation to the fictive surface of the canvas, uh, pulsing in and out the uh, celebrated push-pull uh, that Hoffman always talked about. Uh, Kresh remains loyal to this idea. Um, painting uh, modest size paintings that are very much about specific places, uh, perceptual, but very inventive. And again, with this superheated sense of color. Robert De Niro Sr., who was very close to Hoffman. In fact, um, Hoffman was the godfather of his son, the actor. Uh, his wife was another Hoffman student. And uh, it doesn't take much imagination to realize that De Niro is someone who was extraordinarily interested in Matisse. And again, as I say, uh, 
Hoffman was a great admirer of Matisse. Uh, he was um, constantly telling his students about the significance of Matisse uh, when, as I said before, Picasso was the artist who stood for modernism. The, just parenthetically, one of the great, great mysteries, and I ask everybody this, uh, Hoffman was living in Paris at the time that Matisse had his short-lived school in Paris. Hoffman did not enroll in Matisse's school. Um, this is, it makes no sense because one of the uh, people who helped organize the school and was himself a student at the school uh, was a German painter called Hans Purmann, um, who had connections with Munich, which is where Hoffman came from. And Hoffman is supposed to have spent a lot of time at a cafe that where the German expatriates uh, all hung out. And Purman must have hung out there. So if anyone can figure out why Hoffman didn't en enroll in Matisse's school, I would be very grateful. You can see the admiration being passed on to De Niro um, in these uh, very freely painted voluptuous paintings where he's drawing and painting all at the same time. Anne Bachnik, a um, Hoffman student who remains uh, perhaps of the whole group um, at this point in her painting, uh, the most loyal to Hoffman-esque ideas about structuring by placing shapes uh, in relation to each other and the surface of the canvas uh, by varying color. Um, so placement, texture, and color uh, all being the building blocks rather than any other kind of more traditional representation. So as you see, it's an extremely varied group. Um, you can find common threads among what they were doing, obviously, um, but their individuality I think is striking. Obviously there are other people who, who were painting figuratively at this time. These were not the only artists who were uh, interested in uh, perceptual painting and uh, alluding to the figure. Uh, you think of Larry Rivers, for example, uh, or Elaine de Kooning. Uh, I would argue that they were doing something different. Um, it, it's not based in the same kind of relationship uh, to structure and perception, um, its reference in a different way. That's room for another exhibition, another discussion. Obviously, these artists, these 10 artists were not unique. Fairfield Porter, whom I've mentioned many times, is the obvious person um, who, who is there, if you like, uh, precursor, uh, in some ways mentor, Porter, who was of the generation of the abstract expressionists and who's the old cliche, some of his best friends were abstract expressionists. Um, he was very much a uh, figure of the downtown Cedar Bar scene. And he claims that he began painting figuratively because uh, Clement Greenberg said that it wasn't possible anymore. Uh, the, the world had changed, too many things had happened. So Porter decided that was exactly what he was going to do. And as you see this portrait of Larry Rivers from 1951, um, the wonderful arm, little armchair on the porch painting, he paints his home, he paints his family, he paints his surroundings from where he lived in uh, Long Island and summers he spent in Maine. Um, he said that if it hadn't been for this um, sense that you weren't supposed to do this, he might have been an abstract painter. So Porter, a generation earlier, is in some ways setting the pace. Uh, he is reviewing their shows. He's writing about the artists in the Brattleboro show. Um, he's definitely uh, part of this group um, and he could easily have been included in the exhibition, but we wanted to keep it to one generation. 
And of course, something identical is happening on the West Coast. Uh, David Park, who starts out as a, a kind of very uh, specific kind of, if you like, uh, figurative expressionist, but, but a very tight figurative expressionist, uh, think Neue uh, Sachlichkeit, you know, Germ German uh, figuration uh, of, in the Weimar years. He then starts making really mediocre abstract paintings. Uh, they look like art, if you know what I mean. Uh, they're generic, they're really not interesting. And the earlier work is much more interesting. Well, he was not dumb. He knew that these paintings were not good enough. And the story is that he and his wife loaded as many of them as would fit into their car, drove to the dump and got rid of most of them. And he started drawing from the figure again. And as you know, he becomes this extraordinary uh, loose, free, um, perceptual painter of uh, bathers and interiors. And he gets his friends who are slightly younger than he is um, in the Bay Area to join his drawing from the figure group. And Richard Diebenkorn, who was also painting um, what, I don't, what I find to be not very inspired abstractions, again starts painting from perception. Uh, Paul Warner, uh, Elmer Bischoff, Joan Brown. Um, it all starts with Park and it becomes this wonderful um, celebratory uh, group of artists, uh, the, the Bay Area uh, figure of painters. So it, it's happening uh, on the West Coast quite independently, this kind of painterly um, figuration, which is uh, using the, if you like, the, the material vocabulary of abstract expressionism, but using it in a very different way. And uh, these artists are showing in New York um, in the late 50s, early 60s, and created, creating a, a fair amount of uh, buzz. Um, some of them were in that 62 show, as I said, Nathan Oliveira, who's another one of them. And it's... Uh, becomes a, a rather important alternative, um, of course, uh, subsumed to other things as um, things always are. But it's, a, I think, a very interesting moment, um, a moment when the accepted pieties um, are being challenged in a very serious way. And so one is once again expanding the canon. Uh, it wasn't all abstract expressionism. It may have been the cedar bar, but it wasn't all abstract. And I think the vitality and the individuality of all these artists uh, it speaks for, it's, they speak for themselves. Um, this is clearly not a group of uh, people who are at the outskirts of anything. Uh, they are making very powerful, very individual paintings, uh, which, as I say, I hope I can get up to Brattleboro to see the show. <laughs> I'd love to see these works again in person. So you all have that opportunity. Many of you have that opportunity, and I envy you. Thank you. Oh. Oh, Karen, that was that was wonderful. It is uh, it's such a treat to have you here educating us in our own little worlds on a Thursday night in in dark December. <laughs> what what a joy this is, and getting to look at this work and and hear you speak about it. Um, you know, we'll do whatever it takes for you to feel comfortable um, coming up here to see your show at at the museum. If you need well, us to I, shut down for a week and keep everyone else no, away. No, 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 no. I've, just, um, I've put on my whatever mask. Whatever you need. Laurie, Laurie Bookstein okay. and I are planning to come up. We are, we are definitely okay. plotting this. Terrific. We, yeah. we can't wait for that. Um, 
We have a, a large, wonderful audience assembled here via Zoom. I wish we could all be in the same space together, of course, although it's not clear where, we're, where we would all fit. Um, <laughs> not with social distancing. Uh, and, <laughs> that's for sure. I, um, and I'm very happy to see some people have begun t uh, posting questions into the Q&A, which um, we'll launch into. Um, in, in just a moment. So as a reminder, if you do have a question, that's one way you can um, submit it. Click on the Q&A button and type it in there and I'll be getting to all those momentarily. The other thing you can do if you prefer is um, you, there should be a raise hand button uh, uh, that you see somewhere. And if you click there, I theoretically will get a little indication that you want to be unmuted and speak and, and which I'm happy to do to unmute you and then you can ask your question or make your comment yourself. Um, so I see someone, someone is doing that. So Sam, we'll get to you in just a moment. I'm gonna start with a couple of the questions that were um, entered into the Q&A. Karen, is it okay if we just dive right in at this point? Sure, I hope I know the answers. <laughs> uh, our first question is from the a real Vermont treasure, the curator of the Bennington Museum, Jamie Franklin, who oh, asked- Oh, hello, Jamie. I'm a big <laughs> fan of Jamie's. We've, we've worked together on shows. Nice. I'm also a big fan of Jamie's. And Jamie asks, does Gandhi Brody, who had Vermont ties, have any connection with these artists? Um, he's one of the people that could, could have been included. Um, I, I have not come across him as part of this uh, loose cluster, uh, but he's certainly somebody who is, who is thinking in a similar way. Of course, Meyer Shapiro was someone who was very uh, interested in him. Thank you. I'm gonna try taking Sam off uh, mute here and let's see if I can make this work, um, or it's possible that our events manager, Jessica, who's pulling some of the strings behind the scenes, that I, I may need Jessica to do that. So I think, Sam, you're off mute now, if you'd like to ask your question. Okay, uh, that was a wonderful uh, lecture you gave. My question is, how do you see uh, Leland Bell, Louisa Mathias' daughter, and Nell Blaine fitting into this group? Again, they are people who are very much um, part of a similar way of thinking. Um, perhaps um, in the case of, of Leland Bell, more doctrinaire and ideological than any of these artists. Uh, but they are uh, interested in perceptual painting. Uh, they're interested in uh, ties to the old masters. Um, so again, uh, they, this, this is a, in a sense a very narrow, not in a sense, in a very real way, a very narrow slice uh, through a group of artists who were uh, moving in individual and uh, very provocative directions in these years. Of course, um, Louisa Matthias' daughter is uh, younger than most of uh, many of these artists. Um, there, there, there's an overlap, but uh, not quite as much commonality. Um, but yeah, I mean, it could have, you know, that if we had a much bigger space and a much bigger budget, we could do the definitive show of figuration uh, in post-war America. You know, we're, we're, thank you, Sam. Um, Karen, Eric Gibson asks, regarding Hoffman and mm -hmm. Matisse School, is there documentary evidence he never attended or could it be a case of an artist like others before him of wanting to erase his debts from the past? Uh, there's no evidence that he ever enrolled. They, you know, we know who studied there. And it, it was, there were a lot of Americans. There was um, Max Weber, um, uh, Alfred Maurer, um, uh, Arthur B. Carls. I mean, there were a lot of people that we know about. By the way, this is uh, Lois Dodd, Maine Coon Cat, uh, who <laughs> decided to get in on the action. So she's heard her name being mentioned and uh, here she is. But uh, there's, there's absolutely 
uh, they're very good records of the school and he was never there. Thank you. Um, a couple nuts and bolts questions. Aaron asks, roughly how large are the paintings that you mentioned are very large? Uh, the Paul Georges tend to be monumental. They tend to be, you know, six feet and bigger. Um, he is, as you gathered from looking at the paintings, he's someone who really aspires to the grand manner. Um, many of these works are fairly modest in size because many of these artists were not uh, able to uh, paint bigger. They, they, they didn't, they couldn't afford it. Um, so these, these tend to be fairly, you know, easel size paintings, but the Paul Georges are all big. He, he had a very, um, very strong sense of the, uh, the grand manner, as I say. If you, if, for anyone who's interested, if you go to our website, I, as I may have mentioned previously, um, without too much difficulty, you should be able to find a link to the virtual tour of the exhibit, which um, where you can see the works on the walls in the space and get a sense of the scale, including one very large, as Karen says, monumental uh, Paul George's self-portrait. The Grace Hardigans I, may be the they're next largest they're they're pictures big. in the show. Yeah. Um, Diane asks, how did, we, how did you get these paintings well, for the show? Um, part of the job is knowing where they are. Um, and uh, I, I could give you a list of people who helped, uh, the artists themselves, uh, the galleries who represent them, uh, museums in, in some cases. Um, it's, uh, you ask everybody <laughs> and most of the time you get what you want. There are occasional disappointments. Um, there are uh, sub collectors who feel they have a responsibility to the artists to make the work available for exhibitions. And there are other collectors who don't feel that way. Uh, the, the biggest disappointment Come on, cat, go do something else. Um, she's only six months old. She has to learn how to behave. Um, the big disappointment was another Paul George's painting, which uh, unfortunately was in such poor condition that uh, the uh, people at the museum who looked at it carefully said, no, we can't hang this, it's too dangerous. Um, but everything else that we, pretty much everything else we wanted, we got. And, and that painting that you're referring to is reproduced in the book, yes. as, as are a number of other paintings that we didn't have space for in the gallery yeah. but from each artist. Mm -hmm. um, okay, and speaking of the book, Diane asks, is the book written by you? Um, yes. The book is by Karen and it includes a wonderful so forward by Bruce Weber. Bruce, I was going to say, we have an excellent, excellent um, essay by Bruce Weber, who actually did uh, an exhibition uh, related to this at the um, National Academy of Design some years ago. Uh, it, it was uh, a larger group of artists and a more diverse um, interpretation. It was about um, many, uh, many alternatives, not just this group, um, but it, it very much related to this. And his introduction draws on the research he did there. Thank you. Um, just going to keep moving through uh, lots of comments and, and questions to get out, which is great. And others, please feel free to jump in. Uh, Renee writes, thank you so much. Will you please talk about any women contemporary figurative painters that you admire today? Do you have anyone in mind that specifically redefines the male gaze? You know, I'm so tired of the male gaze. <laughs> um, I do, I could tell you some very good um, painters who are women. Um, Helen Frankenthal, I never wanted to be called a woman painter. She said, you don't talk about men painters. Talk about painters. Uh, Kyle Staver 
is a wonderful painter. She shows at Zulscher Gallery in, uh, on, Ble on uh, Bleecker Street. And uh, she has been painting updated versions of mythological and, and biblical stories um, that are often hilarious as well as uh, really, really uh, beautiful. Uh, there's a very young painter called Charity Baker, uh, who I just had a show in New London, Connecticut. Uh, she's doing, uh, I think, very poetic and, and very expressive uh, paintings for the figure. Um, of course, Lois Dodd, um, who, is, who has been, uh, there's a series of paintings by Lois Dodd. Uh, now she's hardly young, but she's a very young looking painter in terms of her work. Um, there's a series of Lois Dodds that have not been showed as much as they should be that are nude women out of doors, typical Arcadian theme, except Lois Dodds women are doing things like sawing lumber and nailing things up and all kinds of manual labor. <laughs> They're, they're terrific pictures. They're small and they're, they're just really, really wonderful. Um, Alyssa Jensen is another um, younger woman who is working with the figure. She, she sometimes more explicitly um, about contemporary scenes. Uh, sometimes they become, she's been very interested in um, uh, Celtic mythology recently. So they've become more uh, symbolic. Um, who else? Women, women, women. I can I could reel off a bunch of really terrific women painters. They're not all painting figuratively. So. Mm -hmm. but, um, mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you for that question and for that answer, Karen. Um, someone here, anonymous, um, asks: We're curious about why Hardigan is in the show. She's really not known for resisting abstraction. Could you speak to that? Well, she's one of the people like Grace Hart, uh, like Jane Pratiker, who kind of went back and forth. And at, at this time, um, I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. It's a very, it's a very good question. Um, at this, in these years, she was, as I say, doing uh, paintings that were essentially transcriptions of old master paintings. She was doing that whole series of the shop window paintings. Uh, I, I showed you two and it, uh, I could have showed you half a dozen. Um, we have a wonderful one in the show. Um, and then, then they start getting more abstract again. Then they start getting a little more figurative again as, as time went on. Uh, so she, she is someone who goes uh, back and forth. But in these years, she was very much part of the group uh, who were exploring alternative references to actuality. Someone, uh, Diane asks, can you talk more about Elaine de Kooning and not choosing her for the show? Kind of the flip side of the right. previous question. Um, well, part of it is I've just, I'm just not that interested in her work. Um, but she is, she's kind of outside of this. Um, she's very much, uh, obviously at this point, she's married to de Kooning. She's much more within the group uh, who are um, committed to abstraction. And even though she ends up being a, you know, a portrait painter, uh, that's really what she's best known for in her later work. Um, she doesn't seem to share the aesthetic um, imperatives of, of this group. And she's um, I mean, there's a terrific biographer, a biography of her that came out a couple of years ago. Um, she's clearly a, a fascinating and forceful personality, uh, which is from the book seems more significant than what she was doing in the studio. Mm -hmm. But again, if one were doing a broader show, if one were uh, taking mm -hmm. a, a, a much wider slice 
of what was going mm -hmm. on at the time, of course she would be included. Mm -hmm. As would Pat Pasloff, um, who starts out as uh, de Kooning's disciple. He teaches her privately for, for a couple of years in the 40s. And uh, they meet at Black Mountain. And uh, she is painting abstractly, very much influenced by de Kooning. And then she starts painting these wonderful paintings with centaurs and acrobats and you know and and then that goes away and she goes back to being a figure an abstract painter again but if one were doing a more comprehensive overview we'd say well look here's somebody who starts getting interested in reference at this time mm -hmm. so there there are many um many ways uh, this group of artists could be contextualized in in a much broader way and i'm glad Thank everyone you for keeps bringing that up because Definitely, that is what this is about. Yeah. So this next question, Karen, comes from Gordon Faison. And ah. Gordon asks... Hello, Gordon. <laughs> um, for, Gordon is the son of your dear friend and I think mentor, and who was also a great, great admirer of yours, Lane Faison. Um, and Gordon asks, great, why do you think great, it's great, taking... Great man. Gordon asks, why do you think it's taken so long be, for a retrospective of this group to be mounted? Well, it, it really hasn't taken that long. I mean, you, you could, I mean, certainly Alex Katz is anything but um, an under-recognized artist. Um, <clears throat> both uh, Paul Rezica and um, Wolf Kahn have had uh, major careers uh, they have a lot of uh, followers, uh, a, a lot of collectors, admirers. They're very well represented in, in museums. Um, neither one of them was going to be on the cover of Art Forum anytime soon. But that's a, that's a different story altogether. Uh, there was the show that Bruce Weber did, which was a very, very good overview. And for a while, there was a, a wonderful bizarre institution um, from whom we have borrowed some work, which was a museum of figurative painting mm -hmm. um, that was uh, opened by appointment in a loft downtown. And um, it was, uh, most of these, many of these artists were, were collected by the person who put that together and who was kind enough to lend some things to this show. Um, again, Lois Dodd um, is someone who has is a, almost a cult figure. So in, in terms of the present day art world, um, that's a whole other discussion. I mean, we, we're in a situation where monetary value has seems to have replaced aesthetic value. Um, and you have to decide which tier of the art world are you going to think about. Um, these are, these are well-recognized artists even if they don't have the kind of um, media presence uh, that some of our flashier people do. I wonder if what, part of what Gordon's asking um, has to do less with the recognition that these artists have received individually uh, over their careers, but the matter of contextualizing them, of mm -hmm. treating them as a cohort. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, you know, that, that, is, that is a good question. I mean, there, there have not been, apart from Bruce Weber's um, a pioneering work, um, there have not been uh, shows about these uh, East Coast figurative painters the way there have about the Bay Area figurative painters. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the West Coast, it's a totally opposite situation. Go to any museum, you see a very good representation of Bay Area figuration. And there were Bay Area abstract expressionists, uh, many of them Hoffman students who used to go and study with him in, in Provincetown every summer and go back and take the teaching back to the West Coast. You don't see their work. Um, so we, we need to do a shuffle. <laughs> Next question, Karen, comes from Steve Lloyd, who asks, 
Please describe how the order of the paintings in the show was established. The show looks great. Thank you. It's the only show I've ever installed remotely. <laughs> um, I, it was a collaborative effort. Um, I, of course, was familiar with all the work that I had chosen for the show. Uh, so I knew what it looked like. Um, I had been in the museum, uh, not all that many times, but enough to have a, a sense of it. And I had a measured floor plan. And so I, based on my knowledge of the work, uh, I came up with what I thought would make some sense. Uh, the size of the wall and the size of the painting, obviously, is a, a big issue. Um, and then um, I believe that some creative tinkering was done uh, by uh, Mara Williams and Danny. I don't know if you were involved in this, but uh, you had the actual work there. Um, you weren't working remotely. And uh, from what I can tell from the website, it looks great. But it, Thank uh, you. It was an interesting process. It sure was. Um, you up for a, a few more questions? Sure, sure. Great. I'm not doing anything except holding um, a cat. <laughs> <laughs> and I, one thing I love about this format is I feel like, uh, you know, usually at this point in a Q&A after a live event, I'm kind of gauging people's antsiness and worrying, are we losing people by attrition? But I figure, you know, it, people can just get up and go do whatever they want to do if they're not Absolutely. interested any longer. But, but it's <laughs> evident that many, many people are, are, are still um, interested in the discussion. So... Um, have, and I'm really appreciating these great comments and questions. They're really um, good questions. I'm enjoying it. Uh, so here's another one. Uh, another question about an artist that is included in the show. To your point that all the artists in the show were turning against the vernacular culture, and yet Alex Katz's later work does seem to strongly reference the vernacular, i.e. current culture. Very definitely. Um, not so much in subject matter, but in the way he puts on paint. And there's an enormous difference between the um, Alec Katz's of the period that are in this show. Um, and some of you um, may have seen that wonderful show at Colby College about two or three years ago, which was uh, Katz in the 50s. Uh, it was called Brand New and Terrific. And then a version of it went to the Newberger Museum um, summer before last. And it was this marvelous, uh, you watched Alec Katz becoming Alec Katz. And there were these wonderful, loose, broadly painted paintings like the ones we have in the show. In fact, the, the uh, wedding portrait that I showed you was in that show. Um, the, Later work, he makes a very, very conscious decision that he wants to get his hand out of the painting and he wants it to be as anonymous as billboard paintings. And uh, so they become smoothly painted, uh, very clearly outlined um, with the kind of uh, peculiar mannerism of uh, billboard painting. I mean, you know, those portraits with the eyelashes can drive you crazy. Um, and in fact, there was a on, on uh, what used to be the New York Times building, uh, must be 30 years ago, there was a continuous strip of, of heads of women, um, uh, like a giant billboard that wrapped around it. For, it, was, it was up for almost a year. And it was wonderful. Mm. So, so there's a very big difference in, in the uh, Alice Katz that we see today and uh, the works that really made his reputation. The small studies that he does, which have been exhibited also, still have the uh, intimacy and the directness of his hand. Um, he allows that to be shown in his studies, but he very deliberately eliminates it from what he considers the finished paintings. Thank you. 
I love this next question, which is from John Scoyles. And it's, what was it about Hoffman's classes that they would produce such a variety of painters? I think it was Hoffman himself, because if you know Hoffman's work, he produced a great variety of different kinds of painting. Um, so he, even though he was very insistent about uh, his uh, wanting his students to understand articulating space um, in terms of the, the relationship of planes placed higher or lower, suggesting the, a kind of uh, three-dimensionality without modeling. And uh, he, that's something everybody learned. They drew from the model with charcoal and then he often would draw right on their drawings, diagramming these spatial things. Uh, there's a famous drawing by Helen Frankenthaler, who studied with Hoffman for all of two weeks, but then they became very good friends when she and Bob Motherwell, when she was married to him, used to spend summers in Provincetown. But the Frankenthaler drawing shows her drawing of the nude in charcoal. And then there's Hoffman's little diagram next to it. She wouldn't let him draw on her drawing. Um, but he was, he was teaching this sense of uh, translating perception into mark making that created space. But he was not doctrinaire about how things should be painted. And you look at his own work and you have, everyone recognizes the slab paintings with the big rectangles. But there are paintings that are in the 30s that are uh, interiors um, that have recognizable objects in them. Uh, there are drawings of the figure, many, many drawings of the figure. Um, he drew a lot of nudes. Uh, he did very dense, um, fragmented kind of paintings. He did very thin, loosely painted paintings. Uh, he did uh, very uh, articulate, uh, pared down paintings. He, Hoffman was, is all over the place. And now we think of that as part of his strength. That's part of what makes him such a fascinating artist. When he was starting to show that, when he was showing that work with the abstract expressionist generation, uh, who were younger than he was, he, he was a contemporary of Picasso's, uh, but he's showing with uh, de Kooning and with Newman and with uh, uh, Pollock. These, these, these are the people with whom he was grouped. Um, these are all people that had a signature image. Newman had his stripes, his zips, um, and Pollock had his pores and uh, Adolf Gottlieb had his bursts and Hoffman didn't have any of that. And so he was, uh, I've heard it said that he was respected, but not admired because they felt he was mm. demonstrating different possibilities, didn't have mm. a signature. And when he started dedicating himself to the slab paintings at the end of his life, uh, he finally quit teaching in 1958 when he was 80 something. Um, there were earlier slab paintings, but then he became more consistently interested in the slab paintings. And then people start saying, oh yes, now I get it. Now I get it, he has a signature. So I think his own willingness to pursue a suggestion, he would you know, make a painting and say, well, what if I did this? And what if I did that? And it took, would take him all the way over here. And then he would go in the opposite direction. It would take him all the way over there. It's all still Hoffman. His open-mindedness that way, I think, um, allowed his or encouraged his students to pursue individual directions. A real teacher, it sounds like, you yeah. know, in the first place. Yeah. yeah. I know altogether too much about Hoffman. Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it there for now. Um, 
So I, I'm going to read to you a comment from someone we owe a debt of gratitude to, and that's the artist Stephen Hannock, who's a, d- a dear friend of mine and, a, and of this museum and was instrumental in developing the concept this, for this, this show would exhibition. would never happen without Stephen. Exactly. And so um, first he says, please let us know when you and Laurie are headed up to see the exhibition. And he says, I know these painters well, but have never seen them layered slash woven so beautifully together, particularly the, the East Coast with the West Coast. My head is spinning. I have to go lie down. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. It's all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> um, Karen, Mara has been tuned in as well. At Mara Williams, our chief curator, and says that was wonderful. Please let us know when you're coming north. Um, my good friend, the very irreverent artist here in Southern Vermont, Charlie Hunter, wants to know what Lois the cat thinks about these artists. Well, and, she's, uh, okay. she's sound asleep, so I really can't tell. <laughs> being being a, a, still a kitten, she has two modes, which is overdrive or unconscious. <laughs> There's nothing in between. <laughs> Uh, well, apparently she has quite a following over on Facebook now. Good. Um, several now other her, people. Her brother, people who's, her brother, who's named for Marsden Hartley, is going to get jealous. <laughs> uh, they're both Maine Coon cats. Exactly. Um, several people, Alvilda, Bill, uh, say they love the talk and thank you so much. Um, you're very welcome. And um, we have two, two remaining questions, and, I, and then I think we'll, we'll stop there for tonight. Um, this, so someone asks, speaking of Hoffman, is it possible we could finally see a major ex- exhibition of his work? Could you do one? Well, I have done two, actually three. Um, but the most recent painting exhibition actually was done um, at the Berkeley Museum. Um, and that traveled to, of all places, Peabody Essex. Yeah. Um, uh, that was done by Lucinda Barnes, who was the chief curator at, at the Berkeley Museum and uh, very, very expert on Hoffman. That was a, a, a very good show, which unfortunately didn't come to New York. Uh, the last show I worked on with, with Bill Agee um, was. Uh, a wonderful, if I say so myself, a wonderful retrospective. We got some absolutely incredible loans and it went to Germany and there had not been a major exhibition in, in Germany ever, even though Hoffman spent half of his life in Germany. You'd think they'd claim him. But, um, so uh, that has a very good catalog. <laughs> Uh, it was in Kaiserslautern, a place I had never heard of until they asked if we would do the show. <laughs> and when was that? Uh, that was, I think, about three years ago, hmm. uh, or maybe four. Um, since then, I did a um, works on paper retrospective, which had never been done, even though drawing was uh, absolutely integral to Hoffman's work and to his teaching. Uh, in fact, the, the first show he had in America um, at, in San Francisco and in Berkeley was only of drawings, no paintings. He, hadn't, he stopped painting uh, when World War I broke out. It's when he left Paris, had to go back to Germany, had to open the school to support himself because the department store owner who'd been paying him a stipend lost all his money. And he did not start to paint again until about 1932 or 1934 mm. when he was in America. He was drawing for 20 years. So that, wow. that was, um, That's amazing. that was in Portland, Maine. Um, but there are catalogs of all this. You know, it'd be great to have a, another big Hoffman show somewhere besides Berkeley and Salem, Mass. Peabody Essex, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, 
Karen, someone's asking if there are any women abstract artists who's, who you particularly admire and whose names you'd like to share with us. Well, I've done an enormous amount of work on Helen Frankenthaler, who is, a, I think, one of our greatest painters. Um, she was also a very close friend. I was very fortunate in that. And um, I think she is, she, she sets a standard, which I, I really don't think her um, con contemporaries um, reach or her level for the most part. Um, I, I like Joan Mitchell's drawings enormously. I am less enthusiastic about most of the paintings. I just uh, today saw a, a show of Louise Fishman's recent work, uh, which I thought was very, very powerful. Uh, that was in uh, a gallery called Karma on the Lower East Side, um, paintings in one part of it and uh, works on paper in another. Among the younger abstract painters, there's um, a very interesting artist called Jill Nathanson, who shows at Berry Hill, a wonderful colorist, um, uh, ferociously abstract paintings, and uh, Fran O'Neill, who is at the moment in Australia. Uh, she spends half the year in Australia. She is Australian. Um, the rest of the time she is in New York, except she can't get out of Australia these days. Uh, she shows at, um, oh dear, in, in Chelsea, uh, Sears Payton. So there, there, there's, some very, um, there's some very interesting work being made. Thank you. Um, speaking of women abstract painters, Lauren Olitsky says, so excited to have Karen in Brattleboro. <laughs> and we we certainly are too. Oh, and uh, just a question that's just popped up from Eric Aho saying, "Hi, Karen, could you touch on Edwin Dickinson's influence on the spirit of figuration at this time?" Dickinson and Hoffman were both fascinated by the con uh, with the construction of space and actively holding court in New York around the same time. Do you think it was a battle of color and tonality? Well, that's a very good way of putting it. I mean, Dickinson is one of the most mysterious and, and poetic painters. And he was, he was a standard bearer for uh, a kind of old master figuration at a time when uh, you know, people weren't doing that. And, and for a while he was getting quite a lot of attention. I mean, I remember as a, a young teenager, you know, walking into the uh, old Whitney and, and seeing Edwin Dickinson, you know, as a, as a, as a big deal. Um, they certainly were traveling in different circles. Um, but, um, and there are people, I mean, there's, you know, someone like Jack Helliker, I think, was very aware of Dickinson and admired him. Um, someone, again, who starts out as, he starts out as a kind of realist painter gets a lot of attention as a very young man in the must have been the 30s and 40s and then becomes an abstract painter a very poetic one and then reverts to figuration and he, he's a main painter he's, he used to spend every summer on Mount Desert Island um, and and used to describe himself as an impressionist uh, he's in his later years but, Dick, but Dickinson is also, you know, I, it, it's a interest, very interesting question because Dickinson is so sui generis and, and such an, uh, doesn't really have a, he was certainly not uh, an influential teacher the way that uh, Hoffman was, but uh, he he's just seems to be uh, in a world all his own. There seems to be a little more interest in, in Dickinson these days, which I, which I think is interesting. Hmm. Uh, his name is coming up in a way that it hasn't for quite a long time. And of course, he himself was such an extraordinary figure. He, he bore this long, I remember again, as a teenager seeing him in this long olive green double-breasted coat 
and this, this silver beard. I mean, he looked like an Edwardian that had just kind of dropped down onto Broadway. Um, I have to think more about Thank it. You for, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that question, Eric. Um, Karen, I think that's going to be a great place for us to wrap up. And I, I just want to thank you so much for, for tonight, for, of course, for, for the exhibition, for the publication, but also for tonight, sharing your expertise and insights with us so generously. I, I really can't thank you enough. Oh, thank you. This is the show has been a great pleasure and an honor to work on. Uh, I'm thrilled that it happened. I'm thrilled with the book and I am very grateful to you for making tonight possible. Well, it's absolutely our pleasure. And I also want to thank all of you in the audience tonight. Again, I wish you could all see each other and enjoy each other's wonderful energy. I hope you get some sense of that where, wherever you are on, on this Thursday evening. And um, I'd like to encourage all of you to join us again on Thursday, February 4th at 7 p.m. We're going to be presenting uh, in a, a format similar to this, we're going to be screening the documentary Ro Remembering the Artist, Robert De Niro Sr., which was made by his son, Robert De Niro okay. Jr. And after the screening, Karen has kindly agreed to share some insights and, uh, and take your questions. So that's Thursday, February 4th at 7 p.m. We have a number of other events and things happening online. Uh, all that information is on our website, which is brattleboromuseum.org. And that's also where you can find the virtual tours of this exhibit and the other exhibits we have up right now. And also where um, you can purchase a copy of this hot off the presses, wonderful book authored by Karen. So thank you everyone again, stay safe, be smart, Take care of each other through this unusual holiday season and uh, hope to see you on the other side. Good night. Good night. Thank you all.